TNTers. I hope you're doing good today. Uh, I hope you've been able to enjoy some of this nice sunshine today and the nice day. Let's pray as we get started and then we can go through our council time for today. Heavenly Father, thank you for today. Thank you that we can uh, learn about you today. Be with me as I as I share with, uh, with the kids. Uh, give me the words to say so that they can learn more about you. And please speak to them through what I have to say. Uh, thank you that you are good and that you are with us, whether we're here or at home, wherever we are. Thank you that you can be with us there. In Jesus' name, amen. So, TNTers, any good story has the same structure. I'm not sure if all of you have studied this in school already, so I'll go over it briefly for you. Good stories start with an exposition that explains the background. We learn about the setting and the characters so that we can understand the rest of the story. After the exposition, some sort of conflict arrives. There is a problem that needs to be solved. Following that, we have rising action where the characters start dealing with the problem. The conflict is building and the characters are trying to fix the main conflict at this point. The characters often deal with smaller conflicts throughout this period where, where they try to, uh, while they try to solve the main problem. Eventually we get to the climax. This is the most exciting part of the story and the most emotional part. The climax is the turning point where the main conflict is solved. There are still more issues that need to be addressed, but it's just a matter of time before those are dealt with. After the climax comes falling action, where some of the other little conflicts are resolved, and we see the results of the main conflict being solved. Finally, we have resolution at the end of the story, where everyone basically lives happily ever after. So those are the parts of that we see in any good story. Today we're going to talk about the climax of the redemption story that we've been discussing for the past number of weeks. But I will start by giving you a few examples. Have you ever seen the movie Frozen? And I suppose I should give you a spoiler, spoiler alert because I'm going to describe exactly what happens and how the story ends. And so hopefully you've seen the movie and you can stick with me through all of this. But anyways, the movie starts by introducing us to the characters. We find out about Anna wanting uh, starts by introducing us to the characters Anna and Elsa. We find out about Anna wanting to have a good relationship with her sister Elsa, but we see Elsa distancing herself from Anna because she doesn't know how to control her ice powers and doesn't want to hurt Anna. There are all sorts of things that happen while Anna is trying to deal with this. We learn about Hans proposing to Elsa. We learn about Anna finding Elsa in the ice castle and Marshmallow throwing Anna and Kristoff out. We see Hans and Duke Weaseltown, or sorry, Wesselton, Duke Wesselton's men attacking Elsa in her ice palace. However, none of those things, though important parts of the story and perhaps, ex perhaps exciting, do not solve the main conflict in the story. Even though they are interesting, uh, they don't address the main conflict. They affect how the main problem is solved, but they don't actually solve it. For example, if Anna hadn't agreed to marry Hans, Hans would not have been believed when he and Anna were when he said that he and Anna were married. If Anna and Kristoff weren't thrown out of Elsa's ice palace, Maybe the problem could have been solved there. However, these things did happen, and they therefore affected the outcome. Finally, we get to the most exciting and emotional part of the story, the climax. At this point, Hans, tr Hans tries to stab Elsa, and Anna jumps in front of her to save her. Fortunately for Anna, she freezes just at that moment, therefore wrecking Hans's knife and protecting herself from his knife. On top of that, this act is an act of true love that saves Elsa from being frozen forever. Once Anna thaws out, the relationship between Anna and Elsa is repaired as Elsa realizes that she can control her ice powers. 
This is the climax of the story where the main conflict is solved. Anna and Elsa repair their relationship and the issue with Elsa's ice powers is also solved. This is the most important, important part of the story. Without this part, or some other way to solve the main conflict, this would not be a very satisfying story. And as the movie progresses, they deal with a few things, such as sending Duke Wesselton away, and they they slowly uh, things slowly unravel as the main problem is solved, and they can now deal with some of those other small issues. To give you another example, we can look at Finding Nemo. In Finding Nemo, we see a number of different things happening. Throughout the movie, we see the seagulls chasing Marlin and Dora, yelling, Mine? 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 We see Dory speaking whale to find out where Nemo is. Those are memorable parts, but they're not the climax. Eventually we reach the climax when Marlin finally finds Nemo. Finding Nemo is again a good story because Marlin does finally find Nemo. If he didn't find him, it wouldn't matter much whether Marlin and Dory got away from the seagulls. It wouldn't matter that Dory could speak whale and have the whale help them get to Sydney. Those other parts of the story, again, just lead to the climax where the ultimate problem is solved. As I said, we see this format in all good stories, and this applies whether the stories are fiction or non-fiction, and that includes the Bible. Today we are focusing on the true story of Jesus Christ and the climax in the biblical story of redemption. We've talked about different parts of the story before, and we've been introduced to the characters, God, Satan, and mankind. We've discussed the conflict that needs to be dealt with, that is the sin and suffering that are that are a result of the fall. If you remember back to the beginning of the year, we talked about how God is holy and he cannot be around sin. Therefore, we have the problem of not being able to be in God's presence. This is the main conflict that needs to be solved. Now we could discuss a lot of intermediate events from the Old Testament that certainly have a bearing on how the conflict is dealt with. For example, Jesus died on a cross rather than some other way, maybe like in a battle or something like that. But he died on a cross to fulfill the prophecy about the Passover lamb. And this was also shown when when the Israelites were in the wilderness and bitten by the snakes, and whoever looked at the image of the snake on the pole that God had provided for them when those people were saved. Like I said, we could talk about different stories there that, again, are exciting and important, but they're not, they don't solve the main conflict. They don't solve the main problem. Just like when Anna and Kristoff tried talking to Elsa in her ice palace, uh, sometimes something happens in the story to address the conflict, but it isn't successful. And we see that in, in the Old Testament. The Old Testament talks about other attempts to save people that don't work. Humans can't do anything by themselves to solve the problem. There is a lot in the Old Testament about the law, and this is something that tries to solve the problem, but doesn't ultimately do so. It's kind of like a band-aid. It covers the, the wound, but it doesn't really, doesn't heal it at all. We also see the Israelite people trying to be God's people by living as a nation where the king follows God. But again, this doesn't work. Finally, we get to the exciting part at the beginning of the New Testament. We get to the climax when God sends Jesus as a sacrifice for our sins. Jesus' death and resurrection are the exciting part of the story as God finally deals with this big conflict, with sin. It says in Romans 5.19, For as by one man's disobedience many were made sinners, so also by one man's obedience many will be made righteous. However, this man who obeyed is not just any man, this is God and man in one person. Because Jesus was God, he could not and did not sin. And therefore, when he died, 
He was the only perfect sinless man, and therefore capable of paying for our sins. This was the one way to deal with the main conflict in the story of redemption. We can thank God for Jesus' sacrifice on the cross to deal with your sin, my sin, and the sins of everyone in the world. But the climax, just like any story, is not, not the end of the story. Just like any other story, the main conflict is dealt with, but we are now living in the following action, where the effects of solving the main conflict are being worked out. And we'll talk about this more in the coming weeks, but it's just a matter of time until we get to the point of living happily ever after. That being said, there is one thing that I want to mention. Not everyone is going to live happily ever after. It's important to remember that we do not automatically have our sins forgiven. We need to ask God to do that, and he will do so if we do ask. But we do need to ask. That is just part of working out the results of the climax, the major conflict being solved. Now, if you haven't asked Jesus to forgive you for your sins and are interested in doing so, I urge you to talk to one of your leaders about doing so. So, in closing, let's remember that each of us, myself included, has sinned, and that Jesus is the only solution to our sin problem. Jesus is the answer to the main conflict in the story of redemption. We need to accept his gift of salvation if we are to benefit from Jesus' sacrifice. Well, thank you for listening, TNTs, and have a good rest of your night.